This lecture tutorial is going to cover chapter 13 material which is based on chemical kinetics and of course uh, what kinetics means is uh, the speed at which a reaction occurs. So we're going to be mainly determining rates of reactions here and that is uh, what kinetics is. So what is then uh, a rate and how is it defined? A rate is defined as of course a speed and we define that in terms of the change in concentration of reactants or products per unit of time. So you can actually think of it um, in going to the forward direction or the reverse direction. But what essentially we're trying to do, if looking at this particular graph, if the reaction is going from reactant A to form product B, then as we move on the x-axis, which is time, as time progresses, what's happening to the number of molecules or the concentration of our reactants and products. That is how we determine rate. Rate like is, is like a velocity, like in miles per hour. But instead here, our units in, are in molarities per second. So by how many molarity units per second of time are we changing our concentrations of our reactants A and our product B? Since this is a unidirectional reaction, meaning one arrow, A forms B, there's no going back, what this means is that we are converting A to B. So as time progresses here on the x-axis, you can see down here on the graph, then the concentration of A also changes. And what's happening is that the concentration is actually declining. So we have a negative slope. So that would mean then as the concentration of A declines over time then the concentration of B will increase over time as A gets converted to B and we can express that of course key term being there express in a rate expression we're going to discuss another term that has the, the word rate in it so very important to know this is a rate expression and a rate expression is simply written in terms of the change because remember these are slopes the red and the black curves are slopes and what we do in order to write a rate expression is essentially write the slope which is the change in concentration of A because concentration is the Y or the rise axis over the change in time which is the run or the x-axis. So rise over run, of course, is how you can calculate a slope. Notice again, it's the change in concentration over the change in time. And the here for A, it is a negative change of concentration of A over time. Why? Because the concentration is declining, hence the negative sign. And it's a negative slope, again a negative sign. For B, it would be a positive slope because it is increasing and you can see the red curve for B molecules is indeed an increased or positive slope so the change of B concentration over the change in time would then tell you the rate for B the rate of decline in A molecules or the rate of decline in reactants which is equal to the rate of product formation or the rate of increase in concentration of B molecules if you're not familiar with the uh, symbol delta, that means change in, change in. And if you're not familiar with the bracket representation, that is to represent concentration. Whenever you see brackets, that means concentration. And therefore, your unit must be in molarity, capital M. All right, so what if we have now some perhaps coefficients? Let's see how coefficients would make a, a difference in writing our rate expression. For example, 2A equals B. What that means is that for every two moles of A, we produce one mole of B. Or technically, we make half as much. So this would make the rate of A half as much of that of B. So the rate of A is equal to, again, negative, because it is a negative slope, a decline in A one-half the change of concentration of A over T. So this part does not really change. But the one-half represents, of course, this uh, coefficient. It's always one over the coefficient. 
1 over 2, 1 over 2. But of course you can make sense of it as we were making half as much. So it does make sense as to why we use the um, formula of 1 over the coefficient to represent uh, how the rate changes. The rate of B, of course, would be, again, 1 over the coefficient. The coefficient of B just happens to be 1, so 1 over 1 is an understood 1. So it won't make a difference here. Again, it's a positive change in B over time. So now we know what how concentrations would, of course, affect our, uh, or how coefficients would affect our rate expressions. Now, moving on to the next term, a rate law. Very important to make the distinction if you're asked to write a rate expression versus if you're asked to write a rate law. They are two different things, and they are confused uh, so often. Um, and it's very simple to keep them straight, but you do need to, I guess, make the distinction that they are two different things when you're studying. And so hopefully I've done that here for you, uh, is to really make that emphasis. Rate laws. Rate laws, rather than just express what is the rate, meaning what is a change in concentration over time, actually express the rate itself, the rate itself, to the rate constant and the concentrations. So, first of all, this is your first introduction to what a rate constant is, which is K here in the boxed equation, K for constant, and you're going to see K so, so many times in Chem 2, and it's always going to represent a constant of one thing or another, whether it's for a reactant, a product, for a rate, for an acid, for a base. So, a rate constant simply tells you at what kind of rate we are progressing in this particular particular reaction. It is um, an indicator of rate. So, and of course, a K is different for different reactions. Let's take a look now at another just sample equation. And you should have seen this kind of set up, this basic um, prototype of A plus B equals C plus D many times before, where the capital letters, of course, are reactants and our products, and the lowercase letters of A, B, C, and D represent the coefficients of their respective um, reactants and products. Now, how do you write a rate law? A rate law equals K times the concentrations of the reactants, that's A and B in brackets, because bracket represents concentration, and they are each held up to the power, to the power of X and Y, where X and Y represent what we call the orders of the reaction. The orders of the reaction. And we'll talk about what orders of reaction are in just a moment. But again, rate law equals K times the concentration of A and B in this case, to the power, respectively, of each of their orders. Please note here, already we have a difference between rate expression and rate law. First of all, there's nothing about time, there's nothing about anything else. And also, a rate law, as you can see here in the boxed equation, only represents concentrations of reactants. C and D have no appearance here. And again, we're writing the rate for the forward reaction. So no product at all mentioned here, whereas for rate expression, which we previously discussed above, obviously we're looking at um, the ability to write it with respect to the reactants or the products. All right, so let's move on. Again, I've made a note here about the differences. And we're moving on to then, all right, how do we determine, for example, K? And how do we determine the orders of the reaction? Well, first and foremost, what we're going to look at is the order. How do you determine the order of your reactants? And, of course, what do, the, what do they mean? What do X and Y mean? Obviously, we know they're going to be exponents, and they're going to have a mathematical effect on what the rate law is, but... How do we find them out? And of course, what do they mean? The main thing to do is, to do is that you must determine these orders. The X and Y are determined from a data set. You must calculate what the X and Y are. How do we do that? We're going to pick two data points. And what we mean by that is, just looking further down, there is, of course, here a data set. So what we're going to do is we're going to select different data points, and we're going to make our calculations based upon that. We're going to pick two data points, and the data points that we're going to pick, because you could have 
three or four or a hundred data points, um, just depending on your uh, reaction and how many measurements you took. But two is all we need because um, we're just making a comparison. And what you want to do is that you want to ensure that the concentrations of one reactant change, meaning they are varied, but the other stays the same. And the reason for that is that we're trying to determine what happens to the rate when you change the concentration for reactant A. So what that means is that we need to make sure only reactant A concentrations change and everything else, B, C, D, E, F, G, however many we have, remain the same. You can't have more than one variable, otherwise you won't know which one of them, of course, is affecting the rate. So pick a set that is the same and the, the one other can be a variable. All right, once we are aware of the two data sets that we have selected, we want to know how they affect the rate. How, do they, that, how does that change in concentration affect the rate? Let's take a look here. We determine the factor by which the reaction rate changes. How do we do that? We look at these three patterns, okay? And determine, and determine by what factor did the rate change based on by what factor we changed the concentration. So, we have three different types of orders. We're going to discuss those next. We have a zero order, we have a first order, and we have a second order. So, those are our three kinds of orders. How do we know if something is first order or our exponent is going to be zero? Okay. If your reactant changes in concentration, you double it, you triple it, you half it, you decrease the value by a tenth, whatever, and it does not change the rate in any predictable way, and there's no relation or change to the rate, then we consider it to be a reaction zero uh, order. If the concentration change is proportional, directly proportional to the change in rate, it's first order. Example, if A doubles and the rate doubles, it's first order. If you triple the concentration of A and you triple and the rate triples, again, one to one. So again, one to one means first order because first is one. If you half A and your rate halves, again, it's first order. You saw up here, no difference. No perceivable change in zero and first order is the exact opposite. It's a perfectly proportional uh, relationship. How about second order? Second order means our exponent is 2. So what this means, and it's very, very important to remember this, our exponent is 2. So we are changing the value of the rate by x squared. Not because it's second order, that means we're doubling it. No. x squared. We are squaring the rate, not m doubling it. And that is probably the most common mistake students will make in this particular section. Let's take a look again at what this means. Let's say you double the concentration of A, and then your rate quadruples. It becomes, let's say, four times as much. So you doubled A, but your rate quadrupled. How does two become four if it has an exponent? You square it, two squared is four. What if I tripled A, and my rate changed by ninefold? How did three become nine? through an exponent. I know I could add 6 to make it 9. I know I could multiply it by 3 to make 9. That doesn't, that's not what we're talking about. How would I take 3, add an exponent, and make it 9? By squaring it. So again, the relationship between 3 to 9 here is a square value. Square meaning your exponent is 2, which means second order. That's how we got this square. And how did I know that? Because when I tripled the concentration, my rate was affected ninefold. All right, so now let's try an example. Please click on part two and we will continue our discussion of chemical kinetics.